Welcome to The Jump. I'm Rachel Nichols. I'll be joined by Vince Carter and Kendrick Perkins shortly. But first, let's talk about yesterday. Sports are so often a mirror for who we are. Sports show us what happens when we work together for a common goal and what happens when we don't. Sports show us the very edges of what the human body is capable of, how high, how fast we can push ourselves. And they show us what happens when the mental strain is just too much. So last night, as our bleeding country reeled from yet another body blow, it was once again sports that had to reflect the moment, had to decide how to move forward or even whether to move forward at all. In Miami, the Heat and Celtics discussed not playing very seriously. So seriously, in fact, well, hear it straight from Boston coach Brad Stevens. We just scrapped warm-ups and sat in the locker room and talked. And uh, to be honest, at 30 minutes, I didn't think we were playing. And then um, coaches left the room, players um, finished talking and, and chose to play. So, um, I mean, I called my wife and told her, I don't, I don't think we're playing. Um, and then, uh, you know, 10 minutes later, we had decided to. They did indeed decide to play, but first they knelt during the national anthem, a decision that was echoed in Phoenix by a ring of unity from the Raptors and Suns and on bended knee again by the Clippers and Warriors, several of whom wore t-shirts saying Black Lives Matter. In Milwaukee, they knelt after tip off. Both the Bucks and the Pistons on each team's first possession of the game knelt for seven seconds to signify the seven times Kenosha police shot Jacob Blake point blank and in front of his children over the summer. Blake's shooting was once again front and center in Wisconsin after a grand jury failed to indict any of the officers involved. The rationale being that such an excessive use of force was justified. The hypocrisy of that was exposed less than 24 hours later when police in D.C. largely just acquiesced to a group of rioters with guns storming the U.S. Capitol. It was yet another stark reminder of the different set of rules for white people in America versus those of color. A sting that was frankly felt all over the league. Could you imagine today if those were all black people uh, storming the Capitol and, and what would have happened? You know, um, so that to me is a picture that's worth a thousand words for all of us uh, to see and, and probably um, something for us to reckon with again, you know. Um, no police dogs turn on people, no billy clubs hitting people, uh, people peacefully being escorted uh, out of the Capitol. Uh, so it shows that you can disperse a crowd peacefully, I guess, uh, would be the one thing. It just goes to show the police policing system was built against black people, you know, black and brown people. And that's the reason those reactions are different. That's the reason someone can walk or run or bust their way through or whatever into the speaker of the house office and put their feet on the desk like they're sitting at home on their couch. That's, you know, that's, and, and nothing happens. Um, you know, what happened today in, in particular is, is nothing but a joke. Um, with everything that's going on, um, you know, the losses of, of uh, many African-American lives and the, the the plight of, of people of color and then um you know for for these human beings to come out and act like they're being discriminated against um because they lost a a, a fair election or that they have to wear masks um is a complete joke you know our, our president to be you know joe biden comes out and, and says you know america we're better than this this is un-american but you know to be honest it feel i'm 20 years old but i, I feel like this is as uh, american as it gets um you know, was, I think today was the big of my lifetime, probably the biggest flex of of white power and white privilege that there is. We see the two different um, USA's that we live in. Uh, it's, it's sad. It, it, it truly is. It's sad. Um, but all in all, we, we came to the conclusion. Look, man, we're going to go hoop. We know what it is. You can't fool us. You're not fooling nobody else. Um, but like I said, it's just it's just sad, man. And it, everybody sees it. Everybody knows it now. Like, you can't say that you don't understand it. Uh, we just, you know, just made a decision as a whole just to take a knee. But, you know, my personal opinion, that wasn't enough. You know, I don't think we should have even played. But, you know, uh, 
we did, and you know, we came together, and you know, we thought taking the lead was you know appropriate. I I, I would have been all for the lead just shut down. Um, I think this was something that that definitely should have been addressed. Um, you know, but there's 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 a middle line to it. You know, there's a fine line to it um, because it does give some positivity. Um, but I, I definitely would have been all for it if the lead shut down today um, to kind of just, you know, bring light to what's really going on in the world. This tweet from Cavaliers coach J.B. Bickerstaff, quote, my eight-year-old little girl told my wife she was scared to go to sleep because of the fear that those bad people in D.C. would come to Cleveland. How many of us spent part of yesterday trying to explain all this to our kids? I know I did. How many of us watched what unfolded on our televisions yesterday with the same sickness in our stomachs that you heard there in Doc Rivers' voice? Sports are a mirror for who we are. And right now we are hurt and we are tired and we are broken. But we are also still moving forward. That hope that one day things will be better. Sometimes despite years of failure, that is of course one of the prime parts of being a sports fan and a reflection of who we are as humans too. There is always a chance to th turn things around, one game at a time, or in our country's case, one day at a time. Let's see how we do. And now I would like to welcome in eight-time All-Star Vince Carter, 2008 NBA champ Kendrick Perkins. Vince, what was your reaction to the events that took place in our nation's capital yesterday and how the NBA community once again had to respond? Uh, painful. It was sickening, disgusting. But uh, I think... Um, a lot of these guys said it best. It's, you're seeing the privileges in, 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 in what you can and what you cannot do and who can do it and who cannot do it. And uh, once again, hats off to the NBA, uh, all players buying in, uh, coming together uh, for a common goal. It didn't really matter of who, it, who you voted for, uh, you seeing everybody come together. I mean, you're just seeing this here, and Doc Rivers said it. And a lot of people, a lot of my friends, we had a conversation in, my, in our group chat, and the one thing we said is, can you imagine, like, look, you see these folks walking in right now. Mm -hmm. You would probably see every one of those bodies on the ground in bloodshed, more than likely, more than likely. Perk, I know you feel that way. Well, you... I, I do. And, and everything that the NBA brotherhood has stood for and is still standing for, I'm all in with it, Rachel and Vince. And I think, you know, you could tell from the coaches to the players, they were speaking from the heart. And once again, they're using their platform. We didn't hear pregame nothing about basketball. We didn't hear postgame nothing about the performance that they had on the court. They talked about the real life issue at hand. And that's what transpired yesterday at the nation's capital. Here's my problem. Uh, and, and, and I tweeted this out yesterday, you know, that I blame one person for all of this. And that old saying that came out way before any one of us time, one bad apple spoils the bunch. This is what happened. This is what's happening right now in America. And we was already divided, but now we even more divided. And I hear J.B. Bickerstaff talking about his kid and, and how they're scared. And all the parents out there in the world that, that have kids can relate to that, even myself. But past that, I'm scared for myself and the safety for everyone in the United States. Because if you look at the situation, no one could tell me that that action, that that wasn't planned. And so with that being said, I don't know what else is planned. I don't know what else someone else is thinking to do right now in the next couple weeks or the next couple months or what people are plotting to do to anybody at any given time or any given uh, place in the United States. And my problem that I have with it, I hear everyone saying this, uh, and, they're, and they're right, that if it was African-Americans that was doing that, they would be shot dead or would be more bodies or more murders uh, than just four. But one thing I could say, too, to add to that is that if there was President Obama in that situation and conducting himself like President Trump is doing right now, what we wouldn't, I, I mean, they, he probably would have been leaving out of the White House in handcuffs. And it's just not right. And once again, it just shows that we are living in two separate uh, two separate countries, 
two different Americas. And it just shows the privilege. And I'm very hurt by it. I felt like that point was so eloquently made so many times yesterday. And there's a reason we showed you guy after guy after guy, because it's important to see the breadth of NBA players speaking out on this. Vince, I'm curious, you played 22 years in the NBA. How have you seen things evolve that players were getting to that point last night where they were speaking so much truth to power and so openly? Right. So I tell you, I, I mean, you just look over the course of, like I said, of my 22 years and you've been in the business a very long time and you just seeing the athlete, the athlete, not even just the black athlete, the athlete now stepping up on that platform and and their willingness to to, to, to be in the forefront and use their platform. It's you, you're seeing more guys do it and be willing to do it. And it, it's just it's unbelievable to see this young generation that uh, that are are in the forefront stepping up. And they're taking onus and they said, we're not afraid. We're not afraid of the consequences. It's whatever. And there you seeing the culture and you're seeing the black athlete. You're seeing the white athlete. I mean, you see right there, everybody's in unity. You're mm -hmm. seeing white athletes speaking up for the to, for the better uh, of the, for the black athlete, their teammate, their brother. It, that's what it's about. I don't think I know. I know you did. You wouldn't have seen that my rookie year, my first couple of years. You don't see that. So mm -hmm. a salute to this young generation who who really putting their feet on the ground and speaking up. And that's how change has begun to happen because of them. And for our generation, yeah, we're like, okay, this is what we want. So we follow suit. So salute to them. Absolutely. And Kendrick, I know that changed while you were in the league as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's old too. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this is right though, Rachel. I mean, you look at guys like Jalen Brown and, and Malcolm Brogdon, just those two young guys alone, right? They're not even 25 yet, but they have old souls, and they're great leaders. And I admire them. I look up to them. Every time Jalen Brown uh, gets a chance to talk about in social justice and things that's going on in the world that's not supposed to be going on in our country, but that is happening, I drop everything I'm I'm doing I, I'm doing and listen to him because he's always teaching me and I'm older than him and it's a great thing to see that this NBA is in great hands for his leadership wise not on the court but off the court the things that they're doing in the community is beautiful the way that they're speaking out and you can tell it's not a front it's not fake they're very passionate about it and they're really serious about it. These are these are young guys that are making hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. They don't have to do this. They're willing to put it all out on the line for the safety of everybody and and and, the, and, and to everybody to get treated equally. And, and the last thing I'm going to say is, is this. To every leader out there that's leading and trying to, you know, uh, do things the right way and trying to persuade for change and, and, and doing things for the right cause, just be careful because, you know, we lost a lot of great leaders on standing on the front line. And right now we're living in a sick, evil world. And you got to make sure that you're very, very careful on how you move, where you move and where you go. So that's just how I feel about it. Rachel. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rachel Perk, if I could add one more thing to that, you know, I, I, we talk about the young guys. And, and all that, but I also want to kind of give some credit and and, and salute the stars yep. uh, of our league that are older. The yep. LeBron James, mm. you know, I mean, I mean yeah. there's D ways. I mean, these we talk about LeBron James is on has the biggest platform, and we know in past there's some of our the stars of stars back in the day were a little hesitant to do so. He can he can care, he, he can care less what you think about him. He's stepping up in the forefront right along with the the, the young generation. And, and using his voice, whether people like it or not, he's allowed oh. to use his voice. We, are at, we as athletes, you as a human are allowed to use your voice. So how is it a problem when we, the athlete, have something to say and have our opinion and voice in our opinion for change, like you said, Perk, but it's a problem. And I, so I want to salute the, the LeBron James and all of the other superstars, uh, Chris Paul, so many guys out there, the veterans uh, mm -hmm. of the league as well, who are doing great things as well. Yeah, no, that's a great point, right? Because when who stood up, took that photo with the hoodies on, and that was really the rebirth of the start of this new athlete activism in the NBA.
I always say we expect NBA players to be leaders in their community. We ask them to go do community events, hand out school supplies, be there for families in need with food, uh, other supplies, things like that. If you want them to lead the community, you have to listen to their voices when they want to shape that community to be less violent, better education for their children and people who look like them, less fear. We ask these athletes to be involved and they are saying, yes, I am here. I am involved, and they are some of the most vocal, most present, most high-profile young men and women in this country, certainly some of the most high-profile young African-American men and women in this country. And by saying what so many other people are thinking, it lets people know on the ground, hey, it's okay for me to feel like that too. I was so impressed with all of those guys last night, just as we talked yesterday about the women of the WNBA doing the same thing during their season, and I think we can expect more to come, and that's a good thing. All right, guys, coming up, we are going to get back to the...